Um, so in this session, we're going to be talking about enhancing ambient mesh with eBPF. We just heard a great summary of ambient and kind of the state of it in Istio. And so now we'll look at how we can kind of use eBPF, the exciting new technology that is uh, you know, going to be everywhere this week, how we can use that to help with ambient. So quickly, my name is Lawrence Godbon. I'm a software architect at Solo.io. I've been here for quite a while now, almost three years. Um, and so recently, I've been working primarily on eBPF. Um, so I've had some you know, time to get very kind of in the weeds with it, um, and also how it's going to relate to ambient. So as we just heard in the previous talk, kind of just quickly go over kind of the state of Istio and ambient. So the current sidecar model of Istio it's widely used, very battle tested. Several people are running in production, you know, massive scale. Um, that being said, ambient mesh has a lot of benefits that it brings to the table. And so things that, you know, Louis just highlighted, things like operational complexity is reduced, the transparency is simplified, so more applications will work kind of out of the box with ambient. Um, but that it, it still is experimental and it still is under active devel development. So the current ambient networking model, it's there in the experimental branch, it works. But it is very complicated, and we kind of see that eBPF can potentially help just simplify that and kind of just enhance it overall to where it's something that we feel more comfortable going into production with. So let's quickly take a look at the sidecar model, kind of just set the stage. So I'm sure you've seen this in some form or fashion where you have kind of two pods talking to each other in a sidecar mesh. And on the left, we have the sleep a sleep application, on the right we have a pet store. And so we want to make a call from sleep to the pet store. And so what will happen is we'll make a curl or whatever it is. That request will get kind of redirected to the sidecar proxy living in the sleep uh, pod. And then as it goes to pet store, there is also a sidecar proxy in pet store that will accept the request and then ultimately it will end up at the pet store application. And so the way that this actually is implemented, you may have seen this diagram before. It's a really good, uh, it's from a really good article by Jimmy Song on kind of the whole sidecar injection model and what the actual details are of how this is implemented. Essentially what this is showing is that there's quite a bit of IP tables rules necessary in each pod in order to get this redirection to work. And the way that that works is, you may have seen this before. This is kind of the, the net filter in Linux. Uh, this kind of the flow, the diagram of how that flow works, as well as just the general networking path in Linux. So the IP tables rules configure at various stages in this diagram, various hook points to, to redirect packets or to, to basically allow us to do the, the changes necessary that even though the application is not aware of this, when the sidecar is injected, all of the, the traffic will go to where it needs to go, which is mainly the sidecar. So in other words, we have a pod, and that pod ultimately has its own network namespace. And kind of there are two ways of doing this in today's model with the, with, in a NIT container, which I believe is the default right now where you'll get a sidecar injected. You will also get an init container injected. And that init container will create the IP tables rules necessary for this redirection. And those IP tables rules will be created in the pod's network namespace only. So then the rest of your application spins up. And then as you make network, as network traffic happens inside of that pod, those IP tables rules kick in in order to redirect the traffic that we need. So, you know, if we have two pods on the same node, or even if they're on different nodes, the key is that those IP tables rules are in the pod's network namespaces, and they only interact with the traffic that's in, in that pod. So going back to the sleep and pet store example, in the sleep pod, the IP tables rules that were created by that, that pod's init container will be responsible for getting it to its sidecar, and the same thing in the pet store application. So with Ambient, we kind of just saw a high, like a high level overview of what the networking looks like in, in Ambient. It, can, it requires significant changes from the current model of redirection. And so let's take a look at how it's implemented today. So in this, this diagram, we see the same sleep and pet store application. Uh, we have them running on two separate nodes and we have the Z tunnels running on the separate nodes that act as the, that's the daemon set that's going to handle kind of the, the base L3, L4 traffic for the ambient mesh. And then when those pods are part of the ambient mesh, when they've been onboarded, now the traffic out, so the, the traffic will leave the sleep pod. Again, there's nothing in there to configure that pod's network namespace. We need to redirect it to the Z tunnel for, for the node that the pod is on. And then the, then as the traffic goes to the pet store, 
the Z tunnel on the pets on the node that the pet store is on needs to in intercept that traffic, and then we will route it to the actual pet store application. And so unfortunately, it's not as simple as just changing the arrows like in this diagram. There's a lot of complex networking changes that had to be made to make this work. So how, do, how can we achieve that, especially if we don't get a chance of kind of interacting with the workload instance? Again, one of the benefits of Ambient is that you don't have to actually modify the pods themselves. You can just say that you want this pod to be part of the Ambient mesh, and it will work you know, without having to change that pod. You don't have to bounce it or anything. So, one, this, this is going to be a quick example of how it works because it is, you know, pretty complicated. So we have a node, and as part of the ambient networking, you, there's no more init container or anything that will, will do this. You have to use the CNI, and so the Istio CNI plugin has a mode, essentially, for ambient. And so when that, when that pod that represents the CNI spins up, it's also a daemon set, so it will be on every node. When it spins up, it does a few things. It creates a set of IP tables rules similar to kind of what the, the Istio NIC container was doing. It will set up a, a, what's called an IP set, which is how we keep track of various IPs that are, you know, for example, pods in the mesh. We need to know what those IPs are. And then it will also set up a set of routing tables, which the kernel will use as for, basically we're, we're using policy-based routing. So in certain circumstances, we need to route packets it to a certain location. And so the way that it's accomplished today is by using routing tables, which is a you know, lower level Linux concept, Linux networking concept. We also have the Z tunnel. So that's also the daemon set that runs on every node. So that will spin up, that pod will spin up. And in this example, we have the, the Z tunnel actual application container. And then there is uh, kind of the standard container networking, which we'll talk a little bit more in detail in a second, where it will have its own interface and that, inter that network interface will be connected to potentially a VETH pair that's in the host network namespace. And then there's also a, Gene a set of Geneve tunnels set up that actually allow the packet to get to where it needs to go in the Z tunnel. So today the Z tunnel is implemented by Envoy. Um, that, that is potentially gonna change in the future, but the, the key is that the Envoy listener needs to know, you need to be able to route to the correct Envoy listener for whether, for example, you're hijacking an outbound connection or an inbound connection. And so after every, so in order to, to set that up, the Z tunnel also has its own IP tables rules that are configured in the Z tunnels network namespace, as well as a set of also routing tables in the Z tunnels network namespace. So combined, you kind of have this set of IP tables rules in the host network, as well as in the Z tunnel network uh, namespace. And you com these are all going to combine to allow us to achieve the redirection we need. So going back to our sleep pod example. So in this case, we have the sleep container on this node. And we also have the similar uh, kind of F, F0 to a VETH pair set up where you, know, you send traffic. So the sleep pod will send traffic out of its F0 interface, go into the network namespace through the VETH pair that's assigned to it. And so if we want to do a curl to the pet store, a packet is going to be sent out, basically, right? So if this is the first packet, this will be the send packet of the TCP handshake. And so in this case, this packet sent out, it will go out of the VETH pair for sleep. And then kind of all this magic happens where we have an IP tables rule in the host network namespace that will determine that this IP, the source IP, is in an IP set. We know this is part of the ambient mesh. So we're going to actually mark the packet. And by marking the packet, then we can use a routing table to say, if this packet has this mark, then we're going to redirect it through the Istio out tunnel so that it ultimately ends up at the correct listener in Envoy. And so that's, that's literally for the first hop of, that's the first place that one packet goes. And so kind of the, the main point is that it's a lot of really like arcane magic. It's things that are very low level Linux networking. Um, Yuval, our chief architect, worked on this, and he was <laughs> talking to him. I got the sense that it was uh, challenging, to say the least, to get it together. So the ultimate result is that it's something that's difficult to read, difficult to maintain, and really we're trying to convince the, the network stack to do something that it wasn't designed to do. And so how can we improve that? So that's where eBPF comes in. So eBPF, a Linux technology that allows you to kind of extend the kernel on the fly, um, it's very, there's a lot of hype surrounding it, and it's gaining steam really quickly in uh, the cloud-native world. Um, 
aside from the hype though, there, there's a lot of value to it. Uh, there, it has a lot of benefits in things like networking, which we're talking about today. Uh, another example that I called out is even today with the sidecar model, there is uh, kind of the concept of sidecar acceleration. And this is, you know, there are several community projects, open source community projects like Marebridge is one. Um, we have uh, something in Glue Mesh that does this. And several of the other platforms also have sidecar acceleration, which essentially uses eBPF to shorten the network path for traffic going to and from sidecars. Um, this is probably like, it seems like this is going to become table stakes for a sidecar based mesh. Um, and so I wanted to call it out as something that today people are using eBPF to solve. Um, there's, also there's also places in security and observability that eBPF has a lot of value to. Um, since eBPF, so eBPF originated from classic BPF, which was essentially designed for packet filtering. So if you've ever used TCP dump, that originally was written with classic BPF as a way of doing very quick packet uh, filtering. And the goal there was you need to do a lot of processing as packets are flowing through the network stack, and that's in the kernel. So you can't, you wouldn't be able to have the performance you need if you were essentially copying every single packet out of the kernel into user space and doing all the processing you need to. There's just, it's just too much volume to do that. And so the goal of that, the goal of VPF there was to allow you as a user to write programs essentially to perform that filtering in the kernel without having to leave the, the kernel space. Um, and so with eBPF, we can programmatically define our network rules. And so if you think about it, what we really can do is we essentially can program our own network stack. And so in the case of Ambient, we can program the kernel to do exactly what we want it to do, rather than trying to use all these different tools to kind of piece together something. So how can we use eBPF to actually implement Ambient networking model? So first, we'll take a quick refresher of like basic Kubernetes networking because it's relevant and how we can solve it with eBPF. So we have a, a node. On that node is a kubelet, a container runtime, and a CNI plugin. That's kind of like the basis of creating pods on a given node in Kubernetes. So the kubelet will see that there is a pod to be run on this node. And so the kubelet's job is to actually create what you need to do to create this pod. So the first thing it will do is it will talk to the container runtime, you know, whatever container runtime that is. In this case, I have an example of container D. Container D will then create all of the Linux network namespaces. It will spin up whatever containers are in the pod. Essentially, you end up with a pod that has the containers you need inside of it. Then the container runtime is going to pass it off to the CNI plugin, which will actually wire up the, the interfaces that the pod will use. And so in this example, um, kind of similar to what we saw earlier, in the sleep pod, there is an F0 inter network interface that basically all of the network, that's how you have network traffic. So inside of the sleep pod, when you use the network, you're going to go through this F0 interface, which in this example is a VETH pair or a virtual ethernet pair, which allows you to get packets from one network namespace to the other. So you send a packet through F0 in sleep, it comes out this VETH 101 pair in the host network namespace. And so if, you, if, if that's kind of the basis of this, you have networking to other pods on the same node, which can talk, for example, through the various VETH pairs in the host network namespace. And you can also talk to pods on different nodes going through kind of, basically the CNI plugin is gonna wire up those interfaces to where you can actually leave the node for whatever actual physical NIC or whatever it is that's on that node. Okay, so why do we care about Kubernetes networking with eBPF? So if we go back to this diagram of kind of the general uh, networking flow and net filter, there's kind of two pieces at the beginning at the, and at the end of this flow that I highlighted, uh, the ingress and egress. And so these are essentially the TC ingress and TC egress hook points of the networking stack. And you can see that these actually are before and after pretty much all of the layers of uh, processing that happens in the kernel. And so uh, TC stands for traffic control. It's another one of those kind of core subsystems of the Linux networking stack. What's interesting about that is that we can attach um, eBPF programs to those hook points. So at the ingress and egress of TC, we can attach an eBPF program. And that means that when we can interact directly with those container network interfaces, which is kind of the core concept of Kubernetes networking, we can attach our own eBPF programs. We have a consistent place to attach eBPF programs and we can do things either before or after the network stack has, has had its chance to do whatever it needs to do. And then with the CNI, we actually also get a life cycle. So 
even though we're not doing things like we're not, we don't have an init container in a pod, we do have a life cycle of, okay, the CNI knows a pod has spun up, a network interface has been created, okay, we can attach an eBPF program at that point. Um, this is actually a pretty common pattern, so Cilium's data path kind of uses this as one of its core components. Um, there's a lot of things implemented at the TC ingress and ingress layer in Cilium. And so if we go back to our diagram, you can see here where we have the CNI, we have the Z tunnel on a node, we have our sleep container, and now uh, at this VETH pair in the host network namespace, we have this TC eBPF program. And so what that allows us to do is, let's go back to the same example where you want to make a you know, request to the pet store. That, that's gonna ultimately result in a packet being sent out. As that packet is flowing through the VETH interface in the host network namespace, we have our eBPF program there. And so what we can do is kind of programmatically do something, there's you know, some pseudocode here on the right where if this packet has a mark, for some reason we need to do something special with it, or we don't want to do anything with it, we can just return and let the network stack take care of it. But otherwise, in the case that you know, it's not marked, which is kind of signifying that this is traffic from an application container, we can use something like a eBPF helper to do a redirect we can like explicitly code it to do that. So we can say, what I wanna do is based on the fact that there's no mark, I want to redirect this to the outbound tunnel of the Z tunnel. And so it allows us to kind of build up in code exactly what we need to do at every step of the network flow. And so in general, the ambient networking is, it is complex because of what we're trying to do, but the goal is that the solution doesn't need to be complicated as well. And so rather than trying to convince the, net, the kernel to do you know, something that it doesn't know what it's doing or doesn't want you to do that, we can actually program it to do exactly what we want. And we can kind of essentially in code tell, it, tell the kernel what ambient networking is and this is how I want you to, basically how I want you to act when you are operating in ambient. And on top of that, there are potentially subtle things that the IP table style redirection um, is like very subtle bugs that it's hiding in there. Uh, there's actually a couple of issues in the open source Istio where there are things that may be a result of the IP table style sidecar redirection. And so with eBPF, since it's, since it's much more explicit, there's a potential there that we can alleviate some of those challenges. Um, and then as also mentioned with the sidecar acceleration, in general, we can use the acceleration model to get performance improvements aside from kind of the stability and the, the being able to codify the networking stack. So I will call out that eBPF is not silver bullet. It's very, there's a lot of new skills necessary, not just for writing it, but also for debugging it. It's challenging, but we kind of see that the pros outweigh the cons, especially with how, with the speed of adoption and progression that eBPF exists today. I'm sure that you know, throughout this entire week, you'll see lots and lots of talks of eBPF. Um, so you know, with, with that in mind, we think that it's something that can really help. Um, and we mainly have been talking about networking. There are other places that eBPF can help, for example, observability. So you know, with, with the service mesh, in general, you're getting metrics for only for things that either in the sidecar model have a proxy there, or in ambient, you're only getting metrics for things that are going through the Z tunnels and potentially the waypoint proxies. But with eBPF, you can get potentially metrics from the node itself. And so you can get metrics for things that aren't even in the service mesh yet. Um, Actually, so Adam from our team is actually giving a talk about this tomorrow, um, and Aiden is giving a talk today at eBPF Day on getting uh, HTTP metrics using eBPF without the need of any kind of proxy. Um, okay, and that's it. Um, if you're interested, I will also be happy to talk in the halls about this, but yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you.